When Carrie Lee Cosplay and Lady Rebecca Fashions proposed this historical Halloween event, I was delighted. I love looking through Weldon's catalogs and old-time costume photos. The history of fancy dress is so interesting. Obviously, Weldon's didn't invent fancy dress, and they didn't even invent the idea of selling patterns from catalogs for people to make at home. I'll provide some links below for a few different catalogs available through archive.org, which date from the late Victorian period. So, all that said, I jumped into research, going over all the images I could find from the late Victorian period through to the 1940s, I was trying to find that perfect combination of whimsy and history. Then, I came across a very special section of the V&A archives, a huge collection of concept watercolor drawings of fancy dress costumes, which were designed by or for Charles Frederick Worth, founder of the House of Worth. If you've spent more than 10 minutes in the costume world, you've heard of this famed couturier and the legacy he left on fashion. Most sewists and costumers have a favorite aspirational Worth gown. You might, for instance, be familiar with the grand odyssey of Kathy Hay to reconstruct the peacock dress. I have never particularly settled on a single dress, though there are many that I love fondly. Finding this page awoke an eerie itch in the back of my brain. Psst. Liz. Psst. Make a House of Worth gown for Halloween. Um, no. These costumes are all dated from around 1860, which means cage crinolines, a mid-Victorian corset, about 10 million yards of fabric. There was no way I could do this in one month. Then I was visiting my mother one day, and she said, Oh, oh, by the way, our good friends dropped off this big bag of curtains. I think they're silk. Would you have any use for them? And then she proceeded to hand me 30 yards of crimson silk taffeta. So what are you going to do? Overachiever brain launched into high gear, and I listed all the things I would need for the particular dress that I'd fallen in love with, the hell dress, designed by Léon Sceau specifically for the House of Worth. First, I needed foundations. I opted for Truly Victorian for a chemise and drawers pattern, links below for all patterns mentioned, by the way. Viewers in my October video might recognize this as the project where I learned how to use the buttonhole function in my machine. I used cotton lawn for the drawers, and linen for the chemise, because I didn't have enough of either for all the pieces. Can I just digress for a moment to say that Victorian undies might just be my new favorite loungewear? Amazingly comfortable. Truly Victorian patterns are straightforward and pretty much universally well regarded, so I had no reservations about skipping the mock-up. The corset was purchased as an e-pattern from Red Threaded. Red Threaded makes e-patterns, paper patterns, as well as kits and accessories for their corset designs. I first used their patterns for my 18th century stays, and I have to say, I have yet to be disappointed by a pattern of theirs. As I was strapped for time and riding a bit of an ego wave, I didn't make a mock-up for this guy either. I know, I know, but time was a factor here. To compensate for my lack of appropriately durable fabric, I didn't have any cotille, I used a double layer of the main body, which was comprised of a cotton layer against the skin and lightweight canvas interlining. Victorian corsets take a lot of strain, even if you're not going for waist reduction, just by virtue of their shape and style, so I didn't mess around with the strength of those materials. But I still wanted something pretty, so I dug around my stash and found this single yard of striped silk taffeta, which was originally a sample swatch from an upholstery store. The stripes made the bias-cut front pieces look amazing. And safety-conscious viewers who cringed their way through the grommet-setting portion of my 18th century stays video will be pleased to know that I purchased an appropriate grommet-setting kit and used it to great effect. On to the cage crinoline. Once again, I went with Truly Victorian for this pattern. It's the very early 1860s at the latest for this illustration, so I chose a conical cage crinoline over the more elliptical hoops which were more popular later in the decade. The hoop steel arrived, and I set to work making the crinoline. I didn't make the bagged bottom from the pattern, as that was designed to prevent tripping, which wasn't a worry with my lifted hem. I followed the directions, and the rest of the assembly process was futzing, zhuzhing, and other sort of words until I got the shape I needed. I ended up adding another loop after seeing the final effect, so the second to last hoop in this crinoline is made from doubled up boning, but I feel like it does the trick for that one layer. Oh, and yes, that is duct tape, please don't at me. 
Truly Victorian offers a free petticoat pattern guide which suited this crittlein nicely, so I used that as well. Early in the process, I made a template of the skirt pieces for Archie. They were going to make me stamps to print onto the skirt silk, so they needed to know what the skirt was going to look like and what would be visible. For the skirt and bodice, I used a gown from Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion 2 as a starting point. I drafted the skirt pieces and handed them to Archie for planning. When I cut the silk pieces for the skirt, I thread marked the stitch lines so that Archie could see again what would be visible on the finished garment. Then they got to work, so I'm going to briefly let them take over the voiceover. Ghastly felicitations, boos and ghouls and non boonary purse books. That felt good. But don't worry, I won't be doing the voice the whole time. That was just for me. After a bit of debate, Liz and I decided that the pattern in the illustration would have to be printed using some kind of printing method which approximated industrial block printing. This wasn't because it would match references from existing worth gowns, but because our time and resources were limited. In reality, only one worth gown that I could find in my admittedly limited research used anything approaching a printed textile. This particular gown, currently housed at the Met, features a printed pattern which, according to the catalog, was, quote, printed on the warp threads before being woven, using a process I don't fully understand, but which, the catalog assures me, was mind-warpingly expensive and time-consuming. But our deepest, dirtiest secret is that by 1860, to which the illustration is dated, the woodblock printing which you're watching me create a painstaking imitation of would have been uncommon or tragically out of date. You see, between 1800 and 1830, Europe's textile industry transitioned almost completely from being a skilled craft to a largely mechanized industry. Copper plate printing technology took only a handful of decades to completely replace woodblock printing and textile manufacturing. The new roller printing machines could produce as much yardage per hour as 20 woodblock printers with up to eight color separations, soon to be more. And the printers themselves, as you might expect, were demoted to menial roles for inhumanly low wages, or simply disposed of. A familiar story to modern years, I'm afraid. That said, I think we managed a pretty spiffy facsimile. Now, the illustration itself is a bit uh, gooey when it comes to the details, but we can at least say there are four distinct characters. The bats, one devil swinging on a chain, and two distinct devils climbing pitchforks. And maybe a Batman? At the bottom? Holy mackerel. In any case, we decided to skip the pitchforks and move the bats to a more visible place at the bottom of the skirt, which leaves me with two plates to make, one bat and one jolly old fellow on a swing. This brings me to my objectives for the project, which, considering we had nowhere near time or budget for original practice, are pretty humble. One, follow the illustration, Loosely. 2. All characters should be plausibly recognizable to a denizen of 1860s France as what or who they're supposed to be. Number 2 required a smackerel of research. The prehistory of Satan as a character is, as you might imagine, deeper than we can summarize here. But here are the cliff notes. Satan, or Hasatan, and sorry for my uh, Hebrew mispronunciation, as depicted in the Bible in its original Hebrew, is not by any stretch of the imagination the devil as we know him today. In the Tanakh and the Old Testament, most scholars believe the term Hasatan, meaning an opposer, is meant literally as a non-proper noun. That is to say, what's often mistranslated as Satan or the devil in translations as recent as the New International Version, or as old as the King James Bible, uh, merely means someone who differs. Hence the Hebrew word 
Hasatan is taken to mean, most likely, several different unnamed characters. However, by the time the New Testament as we know it began to be collected, the character seems to have crystallized into an early incarnation of the Big S Satan. The character itself is essentially unchanged from the Tanakh, an angel or other unearthly being who, often at the urging of God, plays the role of tempter or opposer to the virtuous Jewish person. Ultimately, it was the European imagination which molded the visual stylings of Satan and his lesser devils as we know them today. As you might expect, the results were magnificently varied. Here's an example. This is the point, around the 7th to 8th century, when we begin to see a divergence between the visual coding of Satan, the big boogie woogie himself, and devils more generally, his littlest and bestest chummy wums. By the 9th century, Satan's goat-like character has become relatively universal. Why and how this transformation took place is still debated, but there are two likely theories as to the origins of the Satan as goat image. Firstly, it may have developed out of the medieval interpretations of Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. And there will be assembled all the goyim, and he will separate them from each other as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Orthodox Jewish Bible, 2002. Secondly, it may have been borrowed from the writings of Saint Jerome, who in the 5th century retroactively reinterpreted Greek and Roman satyrs as devils. Whatever the origin, the last of Satan's more amorphous character was stamped out by the early 19th century as a result of the increasing ubiquity and standardization of print media and mass communication. During the 18th century, Satan was reappropriated by a new wave of Christian reactionary movements across America and Europe. Whereas the pre-modern Satan was generally depicted as a bumbling trickster, easily fooled by the cunning and righteous Christian everyman, the new Satan was deployed as a visual and rhetorical shorthand for the forces of temptation, unchristian thought, and secular blasphemy. He became wily, a constant presence in daily life, and, above all, easily visually recognizable. Devils, with a little d, on the other hand, retained their nebulous medieval character until as late as the early 20th century, and even varied regionally. Generally speaking, the national flavor of devils consisted of whatever animals were considered by the local culture to be synonymous with misfortune or witchcraft. In 1798, for example, Goya depicted a pack of devils as a herd of mules standing on their hind legs. Physical attributes were then mixed and matched, a dog's head there, a fish fin here, to reflect a perversion of the strict ordering of the species laid out in Genesis 1. In order to fix the images I was making as much as possible in history, I chose one primary reference for each part. For the imitation woodblock printing, I used several illustrations by Louis Le Breton from the Dictionnaire Infernal a brilliantly scandalous little encyclopedia of devils, which became a runaway success in 1863 due to a new edition. This was, of course, written by <clears throat> Jacques-Auguste Simon Colline de Plancy, a name so long I had to cut and paste. To this, I added a dash of Jacques Callot's The Temptation of Saint Anthony, in spite of it being made two centuries too early. Aren't they marvelous? After the stamps were ready, Archie and I discussed placement and color of the bats and demons. But going fully into the green from the original illustration might make the skirt look a little more Christmassy than we wanted. So we mixed a printmaking black ink with an olive green fabric dye paint to achieve a kind of sickly green black which made us both very happy. I proceeded with the stamping on the pieces before flatlining them to the lining and assembling them. After assembling the main skirt pieces, I added a waistband 
and hemmed with a double layer ruffle of the taffeta. Then, because making fringe myself was going to be way too much work, I took some fringe from the main curtain as the lining fabric and polished off the skirt with that. The bodice was next. The creepy owl fronts piece presented an interesting challenge. How the heck was I going to make that work? I laid by that problem for a bit and focused on the bodice generally. Again, I used the pattern from Patterns of Fashion, but instead of sizing up in the way I had normally done, which was to measure the page and then draw a corresponding line of the correct size on paper, I found an American Duchess tutorial on how to size up scanned pattern images. I used components of this tutorial and Morgan Donner's guide as my needs sat somewhere in the middle. I scanned the bodice pieces, enlarged them to 800% in Photoshop, and printed them out. Based on the measurements of my corset, I knew I would have to size up the bodice, but only by one or two inches. This is another reason why I chose this pattern. It was close enough to my own measurements that the adjustments would be minimal. Once again, I kind of called my shot and didn't make a mock-up. The bodice was constructed with the linen lining, the red taffeta for interlining, which together had enough weight and strength to handle the light boning along a few of the seams. Then the horrible polyester was added to the outer layer to hide the boning channels. The illustration features a dark bodice, of which the main event is the owl, so I didn't spend too much time making the bodice look perfect, especially on the outside, but I did add some decorative stitches to make the back where the owl didn't touch look a little bit like flames? Maybe that's a reach, but I like it. I didn't want to spend any time on fiddly sewn eyelets on the back of the bodice, and I felt like grommets were going to be a little bit too much for an outer piece. So I got creative and reinforced the back edges with a combination of two or three decorative stitches from my machine, which, while effective, probably not the prettiest thing I've ever done. I comforted myself by thinking that the veil would likely hide those details on the final look. Now I couldn't put it off anymore. I needed to make the owl. In the way that these things happen, while I was searching for something else in a small thrift store, I came across some slightly disturbing, but nevertheless fortuitous items. Two packages of feathers, and a set of plaster beads in the shape of an owl's eyes and beak. What? Not being one to look a gift horse in the mouth, I took these items home so I could make the owl front out of them. Now, I will say, I don't like using real feathers unless I'm absolutely sure I know where they were sourced from and the welfare of the birds involved. However, the state of these packages had me guessing that they were packaged before I was born, so I felt somewhat absolved from the ethical dubiousness of this choice. If I was buying the feathers new, I would probably have chosen either to use some other material or spend a lot of money on verifiably ethical feathers. I cut a piece of scrap leather to use as my base. I wanted something that could stand up to the glue without ruining the surface underneath. But also, it was around now that I thought of the punny title for the video, Hellbent for Leather, and I felt like it was a bit of a cheat if I didn't have any leather in the ensemble. So yeah, I'm making my life choices based on puns. That's where we're at. I didn't want to put the owl on the gown directly, for fear of A, screwing up, or B, making it too stiff with the glue to put the bodice back on. I used a combination of rubber cement, feathers, acrylic paint, and the weird beads, and had a whale of an evening. I felt like I was reliving all of my days doing primary school crafts. It was so much fun, and in the end, turned out way better than I expected. This was, by far, the highest risk of the whole endeavor as it could have made the whole thing look real weird. As much as I was having fun, I did want it to turn out well in the end. I added strategic snaps to the bodice so that I didn't have to get all that massive nonsense under my machine needle. This was done with medium success, but I feel like I pulled it off. Now, the final piece. The demon headpiece. Dun dun dun. The veil was achieved with hot glue and a metal headband, despise me if you dare. I'll send it back over to Archie for the creation portion. I'm sorry to say that the sculpture got away from me a bit, 
and ended up looking a bit more at home in a Warhammer figurine collection than a Victorian fancy dress party. That said, the design of the figure was drawn completely from one source, Louis Leopold Wally's illustration for the cover of Tartini's Violin Sonata in G Minor, which, Tartini claimed, he first heard played by the devil in a dream. If you look closely, I'm sure you'll recognize the ears, the horns, and the absent lower jaw, but I'm sorry to say Tartini would no doubt be disappointed with the likeness. A last note. As you may have guessed, the Victorians would not have had easy access to easy-cut rubber matting or to low-temperature polymer clay. Most likely, the miniature devil in the illustration would have been carved from soft wood or some other easily available material. I'll remind any nitpickers in the audience that this is a playful interpretation and not a historical reconstruction. And that's a wrap. Got it in one. That's a joke. I did not get it in one. Thanks for editing this, sweetie. And we're back. Okay, so I'm not going to lie. The demon, once it was made, was the fiddliest bit of the whole costume. I ended up affixing it to a headband with two pieces of MDF board, held together with epoxy adhesive, which smelled great. It was heavy. Despite our best efforts, there isn't any graceful way of attaching this thing to your head. There was meant to be a kind of flame tiara headpiece, but I ran out of time. So my mother and I contrived a rigging of clips to hold the black veil to the headpiece. We didn't succeed in hiding the whole platform, but we did manage to make it look like one large piece, which is more than I expected, frankly. I purchased some individual beads that I felt were particularly reflective of the overall look of the gown and assembled them myself using some copper wiring. This was something that I did without the appropriate tools, despite my recommendations from my previous video. I do not own needle nose pliers, unfortunately. So I used regular pliers and, again, medium success. I feel like in the end, the effect was good. I borrowed my parents' living room for the reveal and dressing portion of the video, as they have a beautiful Victorian sofa and some lovely Victorian style props. Another time, I may take you on a tour of the many dragons in my mother's collection, but I felt it was only right to make the dragon candlesticks one of the stars of this particular video. Things I learned from this experience. If I ever think that I am a perfectionist or an overachiever, I should look to Archie, who quite rightly puts all of my ambition to shame. Their work ethic, dedication to accuracy, and keeping to the spirit of the ensemble amazed me. I am still learning how to be a project manager. While I'm fine when I move my own deadlines and change the nature of my project on a whim, it's not good practice when you're working with someone else. Archie is a professional artist, and I often forgot that along with a spouse, I was working with a colleague on a collaborative project and didn't always treat that colleague with the most consideration when it came to my needs and expectations. I am learning, and I'm grateful that they were patient with me throughout this project. I also learned that I am a maniac. This was way too much to take on, but it was so much fun that I can't imagine not having done it. I learned so much about my capabilities, my creative thinking, and my resourcefulness. I am so dang pleased with how this turned out. I'm going to go to sleep for 10 years now, but thank you so much for watching. Please have a look at the other amazing historical Halloween videos that fellow costumers have made. Links to a full playlist in the description. You can check out a link to Archie's other non-costuming work in the description as well, and you can hit them up for commissions there. Please subscribe to see more videos, and support me on Ko-fi to help me make more of these amazing videos. Happy Halloween! My camera's yelling at me that it's running out of batteries. That probably means I should go home, eh? Mm. different bats. <laughs> Alright. Alright, it's gonna die in just a second. I'm gonna turn off the camera.